Ouf. So, benvenuti. Um, this is the last slot for the, uh, the, the day, the last session. I'm very happy to see you here. Uh, I see some smiling faces. I guess this has been a very interesting experience for some of you who has been here for the first time. Okay, that's a good number. Excellent. Next time, make sure you bring a friend or more. All right. So um, <clears throat> we have less than 50 minutes to talk about a particular topic, which is uh, testing in Java. And uh, I assume that most of you are Java developers in some way or another. Am I right? Yeah. Who loves the Java? I love the Java. Excellent, my people. All right. So disclaimer. The things that we're going to see today are open source, right? Which means that instead of what we saw earlier in the keynote that you will do HTTP2 HTTP on Monday, right? Yes. You can use these things right away because they also open source. Instead of going home and then relaxing and having family on Sunday, you will work on open source with this thing, right? Of course. Okay, my goal is at the end of the session, you continue to feel like this, amazed by so much great content, that should make your daily work a much better experience, right? So my name is Andrew Samurai. I come from Mexico, so I speak Spanish. I understand some of the Italian. I'm very bad at Italian, but I love the pizza. You guys are great at pizza. And uh, I work for this company, Canoe. You might have heard it. It's one of the sponsors of this uh, conference. We uh, sponsor the voting machines. Don't forget to vote at the end of the session, please. And uh, I'm also a member of the Groovy development team. So I love the Groovy. I love the Java. I also have uh, a lot of experience working with open source projects. And it's thanks to those experiences with open source and with our customers that uh, we have found a series of projects that allow us to uh, write tests in a much better way, in a much effective way. All right. So here we go. All of the code that you can, that we're going to see today is reachable at that URL. And all the code is open source. You are free to use it. All right. You will also get the slides at the end, so don't worry. And uh, so here we go. Now, uh, if you are like me, you probably do some testing from time to time. Now, myself, when I was uh, 20 years uh, younger, I thought that, oh, who needs that, right? So we got real users. We always test in production. That's what uh, DevOps is, right? And uh, well, no, we actually need to do some testing. And so the first thing that you pick up is probably JUnit. Uh, let's say, who uses TestNG? Huh? Yeah, it's uh, JUnit. So there's only one guy uses TestNG. Uh, JUnit? Excellent. Most of you. Uh, Spark? Aha. Uh -huh. This is going to be new for you guys. All right. So uh, with these frameworks, you usually what you do is you create some class on the test, some instances in some way, uh, hook in some collaborators, execute some stimuli, and then comes the gravy, which is making assertions on the things that you expect to happen. Now, there are many ways to do it. In the old days of JUnit, we only had uh, something like assert equals, assert true, and so whatnot. The great thing about this is that you get an error if something fails, if the check is not correct. But the description of the error was uh, not that good. You simply said, oh, something failed, right, unless you write a special message. So in JUnit 4, we got an additional library called Hamcrest. Now, what's the weird name? Hamcrest is just an anagram on matcher. And what Hamcrest does, it gives you the capability of defining an assertion that is self-describing. So in the case of this assertion, I don't know if you can actually see it, but in the blue is the things that are supposed to be different. Uh, sorry, I lost the, the PowerPoint slide, so I'm showing something that is just PDF. Uh, so in the blue there, uh, do I have the uh, pointer? Yeah. Uh, that's just a regular Hamcrest matcher. I will assume that most of you are already familiar with this because Hamcrest comes bundled with JUnit 4. Now, if these things happens to fail, it will tell you, I expected value test, but I got hello test, so a very descriptive error. And you can do this with Booleans and objects and collections. There's actually a good chunk of assertions coming from Hamcrest core and Hamcrest library 
that you can use from the get-go. And if any of these things are not ready for a particular type or, or class that you have in your current project, then you can stem Hamcrest and create your own assertions. By the way, I get, uh, I talk very fast when I get excited about these things, and these things get me very excited. So if you say something like, please, Andres, stop it, go a little bit slower. Or if you have any questions at any time, please let me know. I'll try my best to answer them. So this is basically Hamcrest. I, I expect, again, most of you to be familiar with this in one way or another. So the advantages are that it's already there if you use JUnit. And it's easily extensible, and it supports many different assertions already. Right. Uh, AssertJ is a different framework uh, for also providing assertions. Now, so what is thing here, this new in blue, is that we also got an assert that method, all right? Then we got some, some value there that we want to test. But what it starts to look different here is that instead of passing an additional object to the assertion method, we do a method chain. And this method chain, this equal to, will give us the answer to if this thing is equal to the other or not. But what is important here, and something that I cannot show in a static code, but if I were to do this in the IDE, is that this equal to method will only appear if the value here has access to that. So uh, assert J tries to be a smart and use a feature, uh, true generics, known as self types. If this is were to be a map, then the methods that I can, can call here on the other side will only work if they accept a map. If this thing is a string, then the methods will only take a string. So you got some type safety when also providing the assertions. Because notice that if I go back here to Hamcrest, I can, if I want to, use the size matcher for collections or the contains matter for collections. Is that thing a collection? No, it's not. It's a string. So at runtime, there will be a, a, a bad error because we did something that was not supposed to be done. But in the case of assertJ, the type of assertions that we can write will only follow the particular type or value that we have on the right side, or I mean on the left side. So in this way, if you use code completion in the IDE, it can tell you which kind of things you can do. And moreover, is that you can continue chaining more things. One thing is that I can say is, is equal to hello test. And I can also assert that the size is, uh, what will be the size? Uh, 6, 4, 10, 11. And that it contains two E's and it contains two L. So I can do more, right, instead of just a single assertion. One extra thing that a assert allows you to do is soft asserts, or multiple assertions in one block. Regardless if you use Hamcrest or not, but in this way, if I make another assert that call, that will be two different assertions, right? What happens with the second assertion if the first one fails? Will it be tested? Will it be checked? No, it's going to be skipped. So we fail. We fix the, pr the first problem, then run the test, and now we get the error for the second in case that is a problem. Now, with soft assertions, what can happen is that you can make these two things, these, these at, or as many methods as you want, to be evaluated as a single block. So it could be the case that all of them fail, but all of them will be checked before the whole method fails. And at the end, this uh, assert J will tell you, well, out of the five assertions that you wrote, the first and the third fail. The other three are fine. So that's an improvement. What I like about uh, assert J is, again, the Fluent API design and that you have multiple assertions. Uh, there is a little bit of history coming here, coming from an older project called Fest, which came from Swing, which tells you that the desktop still matters. I'm a desktop guy, by the way. And uh, it is inspired by Handcrest and is actually extensible. Here's another project called Truth from Google. And uh, the test case looks almost the same. Actually, it's the same. So what is the difference? The difference is that this project is maintained by Google developers. It's an in-house project from Google. So if you like Google stuff, 
true is the, the thing that you want to use. Because it so happens that it gives you a fluent interface design, just like Astro J. It is inspired by Fest, because the guy that created Fest now works for Google, and uh, is supported by Google. So there you go. Anybody here has used already the Go programming language? All right. So Go, of the many things that it has, it also has the capabilities for writing test code. And one of the things that they do is it also gives you the ability to have multiple checks and do not fail on the first failure. So there is a project called JGo Testing, inspired by the testing features found in Go. And what you can do here, this actually, this is code that I copy and pasted directly from the, uh, uh, the documentation, is that uh, first we make use of a rule. Anybody here familiar with JUnit rules? Uh, some of you. Basically what you're doing, you're decorating a test case. You can decorate it per method, which is what this rule is doing, or you can decorate it by the whole test case. It's as akin as annotating a static method with before class and after class. All right? So this is the before and after, the same thing. This rule with this object will be active for every test method that we have here. Now, what this thing is doing is that it will give me access to uh, recording any kind of messages that I want just because, or I can have multiple checks also following a fluent interface design where I can use Handcrest matchers, or I can use J matchers, or even a truth matchers if I want to. But if any of these were to throw out an exception, then the rule that Arrain decorates the whole test method will grab that exception and make the test fail. And if any of these fails but the others do not, then I will get a detailed report of what actually fails. So it's kind of the multiple assertions uh, feature that we found in the previous ones. So it's a matter of preference whether you like fluent design or not. Yes, question over there. Yes, this, this, they follow the same JUnit format. So this, this thing is just an extension over how JUnit will work. It, it doesn't, uh, what, what, what's the word I'm saying? It kind of relies on the same mechanism as JUnit, so it's JUnit friendly. Or any, any reporting mechanism that expects JUnit-like errors will also work with this. Yes, so this is just a little bit of a visual thing. It doesn't really change completely what's happening underneath. Good question, thank you. So that's basically it. So if you know a little bit of Go, then this could be another way to get started with uh, going back and forth within Java. How are we doing so far? Because we only have covered at least four versions of how you can make assertions. This is the easiest thing. Now we get started with the real deal, all right? So say, for example, and uh, that um, you need to test out or have to write a client for a REST-based API because almost everybody has to work with a REST API. Now, the code could be server-side if you want to, but in this case, I decided to make it a desktop application with a game. I'm a desktop guy, but also because if you are on the desktop, you have to take care about concurrency issues because everything that you do in the UI must happen in a very specific thread, the UI thread, and everything that is not such as querying a REST API, a REST endpoint, must happen outside the UI, okay? So the application that I have, and I tested the network before joining, so let's see if this actually works. Uh, I'm going to query uh, the GitHub API, and I say if I, there is, um, uh, I'm gonna make it this bigger, perhaps? Here we go, there is it. So if the network is alive and there is a Gryphon organization found on, Gryphon, uh, on GitHub, I should see, yay, it works, a list of repositories, nice. And uh, if I input something that is not, is there a teaching organization? Let's figure it out. There is no, so there is an error, okay. Okay, so this is basically the application that I want to test out. I'm hitting the actual GitHub servers, okay? I want you to take that into, in, in mind. So that's basically what we're doing. We need to find a way to test this. So we need to find a way to test the, uh, uh, if we are consuming the data, if we are processing the JSON payload in the right way without actually talking to the real server. 
we need to test out these components without talking to the UI, and we need to build something that tests the whole application as a black box, as a functional test, just like we do with web applications, with Selenium or, or WebDriver. There is a way to do this with JavaFX. It will not concern us uh, right now with that one. So the whole code is, again, available in that URL that we saw earlier. But this particular application will only queries the, rent, the repository's endpoint. And if you issue, uh, that's the location where you see the documentation of the API. And if you issue a REST query like that, then you get some JSON payload like this. And this is one, some of the stuff that we need to do in order to test this thing. All right. So in order to build this application, I expect that given that we are in the year 2017, that most people are aware of what dependency injection is and uh, then we use it, that we need some way to actually query the, the, data, uh, the network. So we need some kind of HTTP client. By the way, Simone, we use OK HTTP, which works on the desktop, not only on Android. Thank you for that. So let's say that now that we have built the application, we have several ways to test this thing. And uh, we, need, we have some service. I imagine this is a simplified version of the, uh, the query service. Uh, I want to showcase how we can parameterize some things, uh, just to test this thing out. I know that JUnit 4 allows you to parameterize test case. But it only allows you to parameterize one method within test case. Or if you add more test methods to the same test case, they have to have the same number of arguments with the same types. What JUnit params allows you to do is to, perhaps if you need to, parameterize different test methods with different arguments, with different cardinality and different types. You need to have a custom runner applied to your test case. And you may use an annotation to supply the data immediately. Or, you, uh, uh, or as an additional argument, you may supply the, the method that, gives the, uh, that supplies the data. Or you can also uh, define a class, a private class, if you will, that, is also, that also works as the data provider. And another thing that you can look at is that the test method now can take arguments. So for every iteration, depending on the, how many data you have defined in your data provider, then this test method is going to be invoked. There is also another way for you to change the, meth uh, change the method name so that it may reflect the actual values of all the inputs that you're taking in your test method. And this is friendly to the IDEs as well. So you should see that, or you should also see them in a standard JUnit report. I like this because it gives me more flexibility for doing the uh, parameterization. So the next one is Mokito. Why would you like to use Mokito? Because, well, again, we are testing different components. And if we were to test out directly to the real network, or if you're testing a database, setting up the database for a trivial unit test will be definitely overkill. So for that, what we do is we usually go with mocking collaborators. Now, in this particular case, now we're looking at some class under test called a controller that will make use of the service. The service is actually the class that we need to mock out. It's a collaborator that we need to fake. Now, Mokito works in this way. We create a mock of the particular type. We set it as a collaborator. Then we define our expectations, run the stimuli, and finally verify that both the, the class under test did the right thing, but also the expectations were fulfilled. Mokito is like a static DSL for defining expectations. So here with controller get service, this is the mock. We say we're going to block that method with such arguments. And if that were to happen, we expect some result. We invoke the stimuli right there. And if the invocation is the right one, then we will need to verify that, again, that particular mock was invoked only one time when that method with that particular argument. If by some chance the input were to be different here, this verification will be failed because that invocation never happened. So Mokito allows you to mock out three different kind of objects. If it's a stop, it means a very dumb object when you simply say, given some inputs, 
here are the outputs. If it's a mark, it's a stricter, which means given the inputs, here are the outputs, but I also expect a given number of times for these invocations, and I also expect certain order of invocations, you have had different, uh, defined different expectations. If the order is different, or the cardinality of invocations is different, then there's going to be a failure. In the case of a stop, they don't care about order, they don't care about cardinality. And the final thing is a spy. A spy is a real object, it's a real class, where you want some of the real production behavior but you need to fake out some things. For example, if you want to aim for a 100% code coverage, there may be some cases where you need to handle an exception. And pushing your production code to trigger an exception may be tricky, but if you have a spy, and then you say, in this particular method, regardless of what happens, I'm going to throw out a null pointer exception. Then let's see what happens in the test case. That's the reason why you will need a spy. And by the way, Mokito, the latest version, is 2.8.9. It allows you to do something that it used to be impossible, not really recommended, but in some cases you might need to do this. You can mock out final classes. Yeah. So, and, and Mokito is used by, by many people already. The next one is Yukito. Funny name. It's the combination of JUnit, Google Juice, and Mokito. So if you're already using JUnit and you need some dependency injection, if you're using Juice, you should use this one. Because the first thing is you can do injections on the test case. The second is this sample service type that we're seeing here is something that we expect to come out of the dependency injection container. Now, is this thing a real deal, or is it a mock? Right? We are calling this thing expecting to be a mock, and now here's how Yukito is a smart. If you provide a binding for a type, like the controller or the model, then that type is going to be the real one. It's going to be the production type. But if you do not, then that type is going to be an automatic mock created by Mokito. If that type were to be needed by more than two production classes for your test case, they're going to have the same mock. So again, you're leaving the, the dependency injection container the job to properly inject all the dependencies as needed. So now, this simplifies things, and now I can do a verify. Now, Yukito has also an additional way for you, has another annotation called, um, I think it's at all, and you can define multiple bindings for a, a matching type. And if you do this, then Yukito allows you to parameterize the test case. And all the values are going to come directly from the dependency injection container. So all the dependencies should be resolved. Um, that's basically the reason why I was supposed, uh, I will uh, uh, suggest to use Yukito if you're already using JUnit and, and Juice. Now, some of you said, uh, there's only uh, one person that said I use a Spark. So what is a Spark? A Spark is basically a testing DSL. It's written in Groovy. Hold on a second, don't run away. Groovy is cool. Uh, it, uh, it allows you to test Java code. Actually, yes, this is Groovy code. It's, it looks, uh, yeah, Groovy. Uh, but the code that I'm testing, this controller class, the model, the service, these are Java classes. The code that I show, the application, everything that you can see on the repository, everything is written in Java. Yet the test case can be written using a Spark DSL. So what we're looking here is, uh, okay, so we have the class under test. Then we've got a different way to create a mock. A Spock has its own way to create mocks, inspired by Mokito. Then here's the stimuli block. Here's the assertion block. And then there's some parameterization block. So here's the interesting thing. Uh, did you notice the method name? What is that? That is a string. That, wait, a string as a method name? With the spaces? Are you crazy? No. The JVM allows you to have this. Java, the language, says, I will restrict the number of characters or the type of characters that you can use as identifier. Okay? So Groovy, 
and the Spark DSL gives you back that capability to use any kind of character. So you can be very expressive, very verbose. Groovy has multi-line strings. If you want to write the credits of the um, Gone Wind the Wind right there, you can do so. I think there might be a limit of 65k characters in the identifier, but you can still do it. Now these things, they look like placeholders or variable placeholders. With, whenever you iterate on a new met on this test method, these values, these, these placeholders will take on these values. Another thing is that this looks like a strings, right? So we expect that to be a string, and we expect that to be a string. What is that? Is that the proper way to compare strings? Yes. This is what we want to do. But Java says, no, you should not do this. But Groovy has operator overloading. So what is happening under the cover is so you inspect the bytecode. This is a call to the equals method. So this is doing the right thing by your eyes and by the JVM and by the Java language. All right. And this block here, OK, that's just a Boolean comparison. Where's the assertion? It's an implicit assertion. Why? Notice the blocks, given, when, then, where. The blocks are not just plain labels. They actually have meaning. In this block, we do the setup. In this block is where we run the stimuli. In this block is where we got the implicit assertions. You can make them explicit if you want to. And in the where block is when we do the parameterization. If you don't like this, it's OK. I've gone another way. As a matter of fact, these things can be initialized with any iterable, like a result set, like anything that implements the iterable interface. Now, what character is that one? It's the Boolean or. Isn't that weird? But the Spock says, I'm going to use it as a delimiter for a column. Why not? And here's my data table. So remember, the only thing that I change from one version to the other is how I initialize the data. And if you want, these things can come from many other places. Now, the implicit assertion here, there's a new feature. Spock 1.1 was released just three days ago. It has a new feature called Verify All, which is multiple assertions, just like in a survey. So Spock gives you parameterization like JUnit params, gives you mocking like Mokito. It also supports mock, stops, and spice. It gives you multiple assertions like a survey. And it gives you the capabilities to use operator overloading because it's groovy. Now, one more thing. Uh, I guess I can show it here uh, live. Uh, another feature why Spark is great. It's called the power assets. Uh, that code, let's, uh, where, where is it? View larger font. Uh, all right. So let's say we have a map of strings uh, that looks like this. Yes, we got we have collection literals, uh, Java want. Uh, so let's put some keys here, like uh, conference is equal to box Ticino. OK. And now we expect math conference to be equal to uh, box Zurich. Like this. Exception thrown, exception fail. Aha. Uh -huh. See, this is a power cert. It will tell me on every portion of the graph what value does it have. So the map is printed just exactly like that. And then accessing the key conference gives me box Ticino. This is the value I need to compare as a plain string, it's just a plain string. But the whole evaluation resulted into false. So you have a much complex graph in, on the other side. You don't know. It is difficult to know exactly where things fail. But with a power assert, it's right there where exactly the problem is. Now, I believe because we use boxed here. Uh, now, this one doesn't tell me. But Spock will tell me also that I expected box X Zurich, but box Ticino was came. So it will tell me that Ticino and Zurich are different. And will tell me that it will be different in a 60% difference or so, because they only share the same box space characters, and the rest is different. 
All right. That's what I like, Spark. Basically, it gives you the capabilities of many other projects in one package. Plus, you can write less code, be more expressive, if you go into idiomatic Groovy. Yet, if you, don't, if you haven't done any Groovy before, it's very easy to get it started. Just rename a .java file into .groovy, and then use the Groovy compiler. Chances are that 99% of the times, you're going to, it's going to work, and there will be no errors. There's just a tiny difference in the syntax within Groovy and Java. And uh, the upcoming version of Groovy 2.5 will support the Lambda expression syntax and the method reference, which right now we are not able to do with the 2.4 uh, series. This being said, all of you that raised your hand and said, I am a Java developer, you are now Groovy developers. Just like that. All right. I said something about testing code with concurrency. I already show in the answer, but when you need to test out concurrent code and need to wait for an operation to finish before you can continue, what do we usually do? Do we actually test concurrent code to begin with because it's hard? Yeah? If we actually test concurrency code, how do we do it? Usually we put a thread that slip somewhere, cache the interrupt exception, give it some timeout, 2,000 milliseconds, 5 milliseconds, how many milliseconds? We don't care as long as it's something, right? The problem with doing this is that we may be waiting too long. And our test cases would take longer and longer and longer, right? Wouldn't it be better if we have some way to conditionally wait for something and wait as little as possible? This is exactly what our utility allows us to do. So for this particular test case, this is the, actually the real core of the application. We are querying the repositories. We are using a mock right there. We invoke that method. And we know this method because this method talks to somehow to the UI it has to run outside of the UI thread. We are issuing a network call. So if I go directly and do the assertions without waiting, the assertions might fail because the, code, the values might not be ready yet. So we need to wait. We start with a wait here, then put some time out. But otherwise, the test case might wait forever. Not actually not the case. The default timeout is 10 seconds. Uh, so we give it a two-second timeout, and we wait until something, in this case, is a method reference, but that is just a callable object, yay for method references and lambdas. And here is a hand press matcher, but it could, be, it could be, again, a hazard J or throat or something else, right? So if this condition is met before this timeout expires, the test case continues. If the timeout expires, then the whole test case says, wait something fail, it's taking too long, you have to check out what's going on, right? There are hooks for using Groovy closures or Scala functions. I'm not yet aware if you can use Kotlin functions, but there should be a way to do this also with Kotlin. Uh, so this is basically a DSL for defining waiting conditions and pauses so that you wait as little as possible. Is highly extensible as well. All right. Before I actually show the next one, because I know where I'm going, let me show again the application. Let's scale the console, and uh, let's let's be crazy. Let's turn off the Wi-Fi. Hopefully, it will work again. Now I'm going to switch to ah yeah, it's the same project, and I'm going to run all the test cases. Let's do a clean and test, and I know for a fact that. I have a functional test case that will run the UI and go through the real repository service and try to hit a server. Would it be OK in my functional test case to hit the GitHub server, the real one? What if I, have, I don't have any network? Will that turn out to be a failed test, right? OK, so the next step is, Let's not use the real GitHub server because there are some rate limits and whatnot. Uh, let's use another server. Uh, do I build that server on my own? Do I fake out their GitHub API in some way for this test case, for this application? 
I, I'm sure that the server is running before the test case is run. Is that server in the right state before I run my test case? How can I assert all these things? Wouldn't it be much better if I run the server just right before the test case? Or even better, what if I'm able to embed the server directly on the test case so that I can control everything and that I can also provide certain expectations on the type of requests that can be made and the expected repo responses given those expectations. So I'm going to run the application. And again, remember, no network. Uh, some unit test, and there's a functional test case. And that's it. Everything is green. And here's the real test case. Come on. There we go. There's this project called WireMock. And WireMock, what it does is a fake HTTP server that you can prime with expectations. And if those expectations are fulfilled, then your test kit is green. If not, then something might be wrong. So let's see the real code here, because I'm not showing everything. Uh, this is not the project that I want to show, but it's this one. And uh, the functional test case is right there. In order to use WireMock, you must uh, use a rule like this. This starts the fake HTTP server on that port. So any query that you do to localhost 8080 will go to that server. Now, because it's a rule, the server is going to be created before the test method, and it's going to shut down after the test method. Now, this is the simple test case, where we set, uh, we define our expectations right there. We're creating a stuff for a get call that matches that URL. If that happens, then we're going to return a response with 200 content type JSON and some values map as JSON. Do the click on the button. This is a test effects thing. This is similar to Selenium, but for JavaFX. So I click on the button, and then I, expect so, I, I click on the text field, put some text, then click on the load button. Something's happening in the background thread. Remember, this is the real application. So I need to wait for the button state to change back again to enable. And then I can verify again from the UI side that I have the expected results. If any of these fail, means that I did not contact the server with the right information, that I gave it the wrong request, and I didn't get the expected re response. Uh, another thing that I like to do when I'm actually doing functional test cases in JUnit is that uh, I want the test cases to run in certain order. Now, this is wrong in unit test cases, but it's OK in integration and functional. There's an easy way to do that. Apply the fixed method order, this is a JUnit extension, and give it some strategy. So now the methods are going to be invoked in certain order. And because I say name ascending, I use the trick of using an underscore as the beginning identifier for the test method. I could have used um, um, some other identifier, but as long as I know for a fact that that's going to be the exact order that I want. How are we doing? So far, so good? All right. Now, I suppose that you all, most of you have to also work with uh, web applications, and you need to test them out. So right now, we just say we have written a client for a REST API. Now, we have created a REST API. We need to test it. Well, we need some kind of fake client to test it. Depending on the test framework that, that, or the production framework that we chose is uh, the type of testing framework that we're going to use. If you were to use a Spring and a Spring Boot, there is excellent support in a Spring test for testing these things out. So you can do injection in the test cases. Uh, you can use a Spring REST docs for testing a REST API. But I'm going to go with a different approach. I'm not going to use REST uh, Spring here. I'm going to show a uh, micro web framework, a microservices approach, which is a Spark Java. And I'm also going to use a plain, old, boring Java EE applications with servlet API. For that, this is a very simple to do application. And we're going to expose the behavior to a REST API or also HTML if you want to query uh, via browser. 
With this, we need also, again, dependency injection, not CDI, just plain uh, dependency injection. We need to map a JSON because that's the kind of payload that we need to output. And uh, we need to handle persistence in some way if we want our to-dos to be remembered. Uh, let's see, uh, before we jump into that one, uh, the application is the to-do application. This is a Spark Java. Let me make it a bit bigger. And uh, let's run it. Spark is now running on port 4567, which means uh, ooh, that's the one that's running. Okay. Then I can do a curl into HTTP localhost 4567, and uh, I think it's, I believe it's to do. Boom. And if I give it a content type that is not JSON, uh, H is, um, I think is uh, accept, no, content type, content. You can tell that I hardly write REST APIs. I work on the desktop most of the time. Accept, thank you. Yes, we got an HTTP expert here. Accept, and that will be text HTML. There we go, not found. Ooh, why? Because I use, I failed. What? There we go. See, live demo. Same data as before. All right, so that tells me that my application is working. Nice. Uh, so here's how we can test it. Rest assured. Rest assured is, yeah, the name is a pun. Uh, it's kind of a fake client, it's a very simple client, and what you do is similar to what we did with Wiremock, you can have certain expectations. So we are going to connect into port 4567 because by default it's 8080, all right? So when we get a get call with that particular path, we expect the body to have, what is that? That's just a string, but it looks like an expression. And we expect that to return a list of something because the server has already some data in the database. So what you're looking here, this expression is actually something that we like to call in Groovy, GPath. XPath is for XML, GPath is for an object graph. Because it so happens that even though REST Assure gives you a, a Java-based API that you can use internally, it uses Groovy as an expression language. So with this, if we look back into what the payload that was returned on this side, in the JSON payload, uh, what? That's not the one. Uh, come back. Uh, the other one. Uh, this one. I had too many tabs open. Yeah, perhaps I should close this one. Uh, where is it? Uh, right there. So there is an element that has to do and that contains a list of other objects and each one of them has a description ID and whatnot, right? So this is the reason why we need to ask for todos.description and that return a list of all the matches. That's what we're seeing there. You can use handcrest matchers. You can use assertJ, again, that's the reason why I started with uh, assertions. Uh, sadly, Rest Assure is not HTTP2 ready because it relies on Apache HTTP client, which is not HTTP2 ready. Hopefully, next version will use OKHttp or HTTP client supports HTTP2. We'll see. But for now, we should be able to test out any JSON or XML or HTML payloads. That's fine. Now, the advantage of using a Spark is that if I show you the test case, um, let's open uh, to do one, and the test case is this one. Starting a Spark is just like that. The server is there, and before and before I start the, before the test method, I start the server. After the test method, you shut down the server, and there is your fake client against your real REST API. Easy. How do we test Java EE applications? Does anybody have a clue? Because Java EE applications must run inside a container, isn't it? 
any kind of application server. For that, we have Archelian. Archelian allows you to set up the container, and it can work in three ways. Embedded, so the container is exactly inside the test case, just like we did with Warmock, for example. Or Manage, which means the container is installed in the same machine as you're running the test case. And what you're going to do during the running on the test case, you're going to deploy the application there. And finally, remote. The server, uh, uh, and when it's managed, we're also going to start the server when running the test case. And if in the remote mode, the server is already running somewhere, we are able to reach out and we can deploy the test application right there. Okay? So the, the way that I'm showing here is the embedded mode, the easiest one. And uh, if you're using Maven, it's very easy to create the deployment archive that is going to send out to the, uh, the container. If you're using Gradle, and I'm not a Gradle fan, then things are a little bit trickier. And that's exactly why I decided to show this thing. Because in Maven, it's just a couple of lines of code, and then you get all the dependencies. In Gradle, you need a way. Oh, no, actually, this is, I'm showing the Maven way. I'm going to show you the Gradle way in a way. So Maven, just say resolver, pass the POM file, perhaps. Resolve all the dependencies you need with transitivity, because you need everything else. You got all the libraries that need to be inside your web archive. You can add as many classes as you want in your packages, production classes. You can add as many assets, XML, HTML, whatever is needed. Boom, there it is. In the case of Gradle, let me make it a bit bigger. You need a different class called the Embedded Gradle Importer, which will only allow you to grab the runtime and compile time dependencies. But you need some test dependencies as well, because I'm going to test out this thing using REST Assure as well. So I'm combining both Maven Resolver and Gradle Resolver to grab the JUnit and REST Assure libraries, so that it will be part also of the final deployment. So the list of files that you see there are added as part of the deployment. Now, this is just setting up the container test case. How's the actual test case look like? Uh, exactly the same as before. That's the reason to use REST Assure, because it doesn't matter if you're testing Java EE or Spring or Spark Java or something else, as long as a well-behaved web application, REST Assure will always work. The only difference now will be how do you start the application, right? So Archelian allows you to test out in container. Uh, closing. If you ever need to test out PDF reports, anybody here using Jasper reports, JPEDAL, something like that, yeah? Sometimes we need to test out that we have generated the right document. Huh? PDF unit at your service. With this, you can assert that you got the right sections and paragraphs and everything. The next one is that we also need to test out XML some way, right? So we're generating XML documents. Is there a way to? Make sure that we are generating the right document. Sure. There's this thing called XML unit. And with XML, this is a very old test case for an old project of mine called JSON Live, where I, I was able to translate JSON into JSON payloads into XML and back. So some JSON objects being translated into XML. And the important thing is this you extend from the XML test case and you gain access to new test methods such as this one. With this, I can assert that the two documents are semantically correct. So perhaps some of the tags are in different order. In some, perhaps in your test case, you don't care about the order. In some other test case, the order of the tags is strict, and you must comply. So you can do that, too, also. You can check in during, uh, you can define different checks when you, came, when you think that the test or uh, the tag order is important or it's not, all right? So that's basically it. Remember, everything is open source. You can use it right away. Easiest way for you to contribute to open source is you find a problem, just report the bug. If you can do more, please do so. You can supply a test case. You can even try to fix the bug, supply some code, discuss with your colleagues. Again, bring a friend next time. Just make sure that the knowledge keeps spreading. So I think that pretty much out of time. If you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer them. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you for being, uh, again, another uh, edition of Box Days Ticino. You guys are awesome. This is the reason why we do this thing is because of you. Thank you.